Support for Postcards from the Road is provided in part by MediaWorks, specialists in video imaging and graphic design. The, the architecture was definitely Victorian most of the time. That's true. Some of the cafes downtown were kind of like the 50s. And some of the buildings were like the 20s. And then there was Fenny Allison's store, which I thought had a little bit of every era in it. Yeah, I love Fenny Allison's store. And I like Fenny. Hello, I'm Fenny Allison from the Phoenix Springs, and I hope you like the show. a lot of characteristics typically found in small southern towns. The groggy pace of life, the neighbors who play together as children, grow up and reminisce together as elders. Attitudes that are passed down through the generations like family heirlooms. But in some important ways, Defuniac Springs is very different. I don't really consider myself as a black officer. I'm a black man and an officer for the people of the city of Defuniac Springs. Been quite a bit of confusion on that that we have us a black chief. Uh, I'm a black man, but I'm a chief and a marshal for all the people. I always felt like that I was just as much responsible even before I went into law enforcement. I was just as much responsible for making the Funai Springs a better place to live if I was going to leave here as the mayor of the town or the city council or anybody else. How about logging me with uh, three, ten, twelve, two females, one male? about an hour ago, about 10 o'clock. Clint Hooks is the chief of police for Defuniac Springs. He's 66 years old, he's been elected to the position seven times, and he doesn't carry a gun. You live by the sword, you die by it. And any time that I needed a gun, I was always blessed to have it accessible. The temptation is to assume the town is a real life version of Mayberry RFD. But according to Clint, that just yeah. isn't so. For the size of our town, we do have a pretty good traffic of drugs, pretty sizable traffic of drugs. Still, that doesn't stop him from going beyond the bounds of his job to make sure that the citizens of his town are not only safe, well, hello, but happy. Hello, hello. How's everybody? Hi. All right. Y'all got to get that little lady straightened out there? Yeah. His routine starts off about sometimes 3 and 4 in the morning. He comes by here and he always says, Hi, how are you doing? Every single morning. <laughs> he goes all, all the way upstairs and checks it out and makes sure everybody's okay. And then he goes on and does his little daily thing. <laughs> I've always been a firm believer, when you wake up, get up. <laughs> when you get up, do something. And, and because there's always somebody needs you. Yeah. And uh, usually, if I go to bed, 10 or 11, I'm you up at 4. And uh, so this is one of the first things that I do. And I've found occasionally I've been helpful to somebody here. Amazing. What is usually done by 7 o'clock in the morning would be half a day's work for a lot of people. But having checked in on all the patients in the hospital and nursing homes, Clint shifts professional gears for an hour to drive the local school bus. You want to go ride the bus today? Well, where's your mom? Uh, you, you want to go ride in today? No, I'm going today. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you. I tried to call you last time. Well, you know I stayed going so much. By 9 o'clock, he's back to being the city's chief law enforcement officer, a position he cherishes almost as much as the town he serves. I'm kind of like uh, Mrs. Allison. Uh, when the good Lord called me, I just soon called me from here as anywhere I know. I'll be go, as uh, people have mentioned on many occasions. Well, are you going to kill yourself? I say, well, put a marker there that die for the best people in the world, people in the city of Virginia.
Like towns all across America, Defuniac Springs must credit its existence to the coming of the railroad. Before that, there was only the Uchi Indians and a few Scottish pioneers. Their chief, Sam Story, invited here about 1820. They established a settlement on the Bruce Creek a few miles south of here called Uchiana. He said, brothers, come on over and see my land. And he brought three of the fellows over and introduced them to the valley country and the hills. And it was so similar to the mountains in North and South Carolina that I said, this is the spot. But in 1881, as the story goes, while surveying for a new east-west rail line, the party stumbled upon, in the midst of the virgin forest, a round lake. Colonel W.D. Chipley was the man who surveyed the route. And when he came through, he had camped here one night and said, we need to make something here in this spot. The lake yard was forested with longleaf pine trees a beautiful setting. They were so charmed with the live oaks and the big, tall, longleaf pine trees uh, that they just were carried away. W.D. Chipper said, we must do something here. Chipley's new railroad needed the support of more established railroad companies to the north, and so in May of 1881, controlling interest of Chipley's A&P was sold to the l &N in Nashville, whose president was an Italian engineer named Frederick de Funiac. He was an engineer. He was once a, a member of the Confederate Army, and before then he was with the Union Army. And he was quite a character, a nobleman, a count. And he was president of the Ellen in, and we're not sure that he was ever here. One account, in fact, says that when several of the railroad officials met at the exclusive Pendums Club in Louisville, the decision to name the new town Lake Defuniac may have been won by the Ellen in president in a gentleman's wager at the toss of a coin. Later, it was decided that changing the name to Defuniac Springs would probably attract more visitors. Where did you get all this stuff? Well, after 63 years, you just collect some all along, and I never threw anything away. I always packed it in the back, and I brought it out. Uh -huh. I never, I, I was always accused of everything. But I would, would uh, ravel thread out of old sacks and find it on a ball and make the children a ball. Really? I just never threw anything away. Before I play this grand old Church of England hymn, which has be, been taken up by the whole Christian world, I would want everybody to know that I am not an organist. <laughs> The only word for a pipe organ is noble. Pipe organ builders use that word a lot, nobility. The concept of God is a noble idea, and it requires nobility of sound and nobility of instrument. And that's what a pipe organ is. That's, I play it a little bit. I can hardly wait to put my hand on that instrument. In 1990, Tom Bartholomew began construction on what is known as one of the most elaborate and beautiful instruments in the world. The organ is located in the St. Agatha's Episcopal Church here in Defuniac Springs. Every pipe in the organ was handcrafted to the specifications of its builder, Tom Bartholomew. Well, I began, I began with lessons when I was 16, and uh, the mechanical aspect of it uh, soon took my interest. 
uh, more so than the playing. And uh, I slowly took it up and worked with some other uh, distinguished builders in Tucson. And uh, I'm sort of branching off on my own. And in that aspect, this is a fine opportunity for me to show what I can do in this part of the country. Building organs encompasses a lot of trades, ranging from carpentry to mechanics, but the best thing Bartholomew gets from it is the satisfaction of hearing the beautiful music. Although the organ was built primarily for St. Agatha's, it's certainly not limited to just its members. Anyone who lives in Defuniac Springs, and even if you don't, Father Fowler and his congregation welcome you. And don't worry. The organ was built to last a lifetime or two, so you have a little bit of time. Yeah, I think it's probably here for the next century. We've just celebrated our centennial year last year, and I hope it's here for our bicentennial. If it's a good meal you're looking for in Defuniac Springs, there are lots of places to choose from. But if it's advice, gossip, or the best darn hot dog in the world, the H&M hot dog stand on 9th Street is the place to go. That is, of course, unless you're with a large crowd, because the H&M only seats seven. It'll stand about eight behind the seven, so that's the way it is sometimes. You can get your food to go, but don't bother trying to phone your order in. Uh, they don't have a phone. You can't call it in. They don't add it up on an ad machine your bill. They do it in their head and on their fingers, sometimes their toes. You know, it's just fun just to come in here. The Little Tin Shack has been home to the H&M for about 50 years. Maggie Davis and her sister Merle Carter have been running it for the last 20. And while they serve only hot dogs and hamburgers, what they dish out is a whole nother story. They coordinated my political campaign. <laughs> they ran it for me. They got me elected. How is that? Their mouth. <laughs> Politics aside, it's really the hot dogs that put this place on the map, and not just the city map either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We've had people as far as Germany in here. They read about us in Germany. They've been written up in Southern Living and Southern Leisure. And I understand uh, Playboy may be coming down to do an interview for a while. <laughs> so just what is it that makes these hot dogs so special? I don't know, unless we steam the buns and, and the wings and buns and all. And they use the original steamer with a slightly modified lid. That, that piece of cardboard looks like it's been with you a while. No, we change it once in a while. <laughs> Other than that, it doesn't appear much else has been changed in the past half century. The ambience is still friendly, the decor is simple. You get your food on a napkin and you can get your own soda, thank you very much. And if you expect special treatment, well. Now, what happened a lot of times, you get a, a good looking guy come in here, now they'll go around and they'll get his Coca-Cola, but man, they won't even touch mine at all. A hot dog is only 75 cents, whether you have it for breakfast, lunch, or supper, and the hamburger's not a bad deal either. I have three hot dogs all the way on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and on Tuesday and Thursday I have two hamburgers on the way. Any reason in particular why you divide them up like that? Yeah, because I like Maggie's cooking better. <laughs> Whatever your preference, Maggie and Merle will gladly cook it up at the H&M Hot Dog Stand, home of the best darn hot dog in the world. Back in the late 1800s, the fourth grade usually marked the end of a working class child's formal education. High school wasn't always practical, and college was reserved for the privileged few. Then a unique combination of cheap train fares and a plan by the Methodist Episcopal Church to train Sunday school teachers sparked the beginning of an era, the Chautauqua era. And in 1874, a summer school program for Sunday school teachers was established in Chautauqua, New York. After a very short period of time, it turned into a summer school for the whole family. Tuition was cheap, and anybody who wanted to learn could attend. The curriculum was based on education, recreation, religion, and art. Suddenly, working class people from all walks of life had an opportunity to learn about things like philosophy, geology, medicine, and elocution. 
Education for the masses caught on like wildfire, and by the early 1880s, plans for a winter Chautauqua in Florida were in the works, and the realtors in Defuniac Springs were ready. The citizens of Defuniac Springs, what, what few of them were here, read this in the Florida Times Union out of Jacksonville, and they said this would be a good location, and so they organized a citizen delegation and put them aboard train and sent them to Jacksonville to uh, convince Dr. Gillett and his party to come to Defuniac Spring. And when Dr. Gillett saw the perfectly round, spring-fed lake, the grassy banks and the pine trees, and heard promises of a railroad depot, a hotel, and a campground, he was ready to make a deal. And in 1885, Defuniac Springs hosted the first winter Chautauqua. During the early years, classes and lectures were held in a 4,000-seat tabernacle that was raised in the lake yard. Then, in 1909, the Chautauqua Hall of Brotherhood was built. The winter Chautauqua flourished, and during any given season, as many as 10,000 people, students and lecturers, attended. And they were speakers from around the United States. They were entertainers. They were physicians, they were ministers, but when you go back and look at these people, they were well known, they were traveling around. One of the most frequent speakers here appeared every year was William Jennings Bryan. Uh, and no doubt he, he was a Chautauqua speaker, but no doubt being here boosted his candidacy for the president. Ironically, by the late 1920s, the key factors that led to the establishment of the Chautauqua, limited access to education, limited access to the latest news events, and mass rail transit, were affected by radical change. Children stayed in school longer, mass communication improved, and people were better able to stay informed on the latest topics, and finally, the mass production of automobiles gave families the freedom to travel to the latest trend in vacationing, the beach. And so the Chautauqua era ended. However, the spirit of that enlightened period is still alive and can be found in the Chautauqua Festival, in the Elder Hostel program, by Emily Dickinson, and in Mary Vincent's porcelain painting. Lasting images of that great era that shaped Defuniac Springs. Snappy Chateau. The Hall of Brotherhood is one of the two buildings in town listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The other is a quaint little bed and breakfast inn that was once known as the Governor Katz House. Sunbright Banner was built in 1886 as a winter home for a family from Broadhead, Wisconsin, J.T. Sherman. He and his family came and stayed here during the winter months for the Chautauqua when it was in assembly. Later on, the house was sold to Sidney Katz, one of Florida's more controversial governors. A Baptist minister and insurance salesman turned politician, Katz campaigned against what he termed a Catholic conspiracy in government. And he was the first Florida politician to use the automobile and the loudspeaker to reach and talk to voters who had never even seen a political candidate. In office during World War I, he never really had the support of the established political machine, and after leaving office, he was accused of several charges, including counterfeiting, but never convicted. And so spent a very controversial four years. Uh, he came back to the house here, uh, died in 1938, was laid out in the parlor here, had one of the largest funerals Defuniac has ever seen. His wife lived on until the 50s, and after that, the house was probably sold seven or eight times between us and the cats. Faithfully restored and open year-round to visitors, Sunbright Manor even claims to have its own ghost-in-residence named Sarah. library in Defuniac Springs is home sweet home to more than just books. Inside this quaint building, an antique music box recreates the sounds of a gentler era and an impressive collection of swords and weaponry, some dating as far back as the Crusades, line the walls and shelves, reminding visitors of the darker sides of history as well. The historical significance of the library is not limited to its contents. Established in 1886, the structure itself is the oldest continuously operating library in the state and was in fact founded and funded by a group of very determined women. Colonel Defuniac that the city was named for 
uh, was asked to uh, make a donation and he never replied to the letter. So up until that time, it had been called the Defuniac Library, so the ladies took his name off. <laughs> it's just been the library ever since. <laughs> the library is no longer exclusively a woman's project, but Defuniac's name remains banished from the sign above the door. A reminder that when the women of this town decide to do business, they mean business. Of course the women from Defuniac Springs are strong. They're women, aren't they? On the lawn in downtown Defuniac, in front of the stately courthouse, stands a monument commissioned by the local women to honor the sons and husbands who died in battle during the Civil War. It's the first Confederate monument erected in Florida and was, as the story goes, the catalyst for another battle, this time between the sexes. Ladies got the monument. Um, had it erected on the site of one of their churches. Another group of men actually uh, took exception to the location of the site and in the stealth of the night they went and stole the monument and took it back to another church. And of course the other people stole it back. And the buggies went and the buggies came and the buggies went and the buggies came. Finally, a truce was declared, and the monument was then moved to Defuniac Springs when Defuniac was named the county seat. So it almost started another civil war to erect the first civil war monument in the state. And what do you, you always tell me that I'm going to get snake bit. And you, <laughs> you believed it too. I know, but you didn't tell me this time because somebody cleaned it up. Well, I just didn't think about it. If I had, I'd have told you. You'd already been in here. Wasn't no use to tell you. Well, would you sell me this? I don't know. If I don't have any more, I won't. But if it's your last one, you won't sell it? No. Well, I can't blame you for that. The ostrich is where the women got the idea of women's liberation. Okay. The man does all the work. He builds a nest, he sets on the eggs, he hatches them, and he raises them. The Bible tells you that an ostrich hen has no heart when it comes to her young. When Schubert Miles decided to give up his contracting business to pursue his hobby full time, he knew that if he managed it just right, he could make a little money, have all the kinds of birds he wanted, and have a place that he and his wife Daisy could share with others. Then I have a building here that's got uh, white doves and your pied doves in it. Your pied doves are a speckled dove. Your doves are not really wild. Uh, they can be made pets out of mighty easy. And these are golden pheasants. The light colored one is a yellow golden pheasant. For any beginner, that's the pet pheasants they recommend for them to raise. The Nene, that's a Hawaiian state bird. They can be a very mean bird, especially in breeding season. All, all your geese more or less in breeding season are mean. Even though customers come in from all over the U.S. to choose from over a hundred species of purebred birds, selling birds for a profit is not what this farm is all about. Well, they're not the same. Why I not? Think, yeah, I want to see if I can raise one. I never have raised one, and I got to have the first. So pleasure comes before business. Oh right? yeah, sure. That's what I got. If I got them for me, and then if I raise them, I can sell them. If I don't, I won't. Wouldn't the colonel like to get his hands on these guys? <laughs> That's your black lane shed. What makes them crow like that? That's the chicken in it. One will crow and then the other will crow. You've got to see who outdoes who. Now these birds like to be wet down just like a hog. And it's the bird lover in Schubert Miles and the people lover in Daisy that keeps Miles Feather Farm going. Retire? We're not ever going to retire. That, that, that's but, something else that's never interesting to me. People used to say, when are you going to retire? When are you going to retire? But it never did interest me because when a fellow retires and sits down and don't do nothing, he doesn't stay in. And you have something to get up for. If you don't have anything to get up for, you some mornings you stay there, and the first thing you know, you don't get up. 
And one thing that keeps us fit, we don't have a television. <laughs> I'm Finney Allison from Virginia Springs, and I hope you like the show. Good night. Loans, liniment. For, let's see here. One piece garment com combining. That's interesting. You said. and credit its very existence <laughs> to, <laughs> to the coming of the railroad. <laughs> this is a big one. All right, Trish. Welcome to Pusher. This is it. <laughs> The extra mile to get We're this story. We're always on the road. Oh, I'm gonna kill her. <laughs> Support for Postcards from the Road is provided in part by MediaWorks, specialists in video imaging and graphic design.